Lord, we lift up your name. We thank you, Jesus. You are good and mighty and holy, and we love you, Lord. We love you so much, Lord. God is good. Amen. He said, it is done. Amen. It's good. Take a seat, everybody. Bless you guys. So I'm actually going to get stuck into the word. I will be honest. Um, I actually wrote this word out three times. <laughs> it has been percolating within me for the last month. So when Pastor Brett came and asked me, just, I'd really love it if you could minister on this Sunday. And I was like, yep. And then I was like, God, give me a word. <laughs> and so in that, I, I waited on God, and I really believe that God did give me a word, and it was just percolating on the inside of me. You know how the Lord just speaks to you over that time, and I just feel it was a real revelation he was giving me. And um, I went to start writing it down, and guess what? <laughs> it's blockages all the way. <laughs> and I was like, God, what are you doing? Lord, I know you gave me this word, so Lord, I need you just right now. And you know how, I don't know, preachers in the house, ministers of the gospel, who knows that there are many tangents we can go on. But I want to stick true to what it is that God actually showed me. I want to give you the gold of that. And uh, I really hope that it's going to actually really bless you. So we know that these last few weeks, Pastor Brett's been teaching on the spiritual gifts. Who's been enjoying learning about the spiritual gifts? And it's been with the desire to equip and encourage us, the church, us, to be confident and open in using those gifts to the glory of God. Amen? It's for his glory. I believe an important part of being confident is knowing who we are in Christ. Who believes that? And being bold to live that out in church, our connect groups, our homes, our families, our workplaces, and in the wider community where we live and where we have been called to. Who believes that you've been called to Geraldton? Amen. Good. I love how the Bible is historical, geographical, cultural, lawful, and biographical in nature. And because of this, we can learn much in the difficulties, the challenges, the hindrances, and the strongholds that people went through in biblical times. And in turn, it can help us to put a spotlight in areas of our life where the Lord would have us walking in freedom, in revelation, and in boldness. And so one such person that we can learn from is Moses. And I've chosen Moses because I want to look at a specific area in his life in the hope that we can understand and glean important truths and receive revelation understanding, which in turn we can have greater freedom and confidence. I think we can all agree that Moses was a mighty man of God, but still was a man whom just like us had his ups and his downs, his victories and his failures, the good and the not so good. Moses had his battles. And there are a number of times where I believe that Moses showed great internal conflict. First, when he saw the Hebrew man being beaten. Second time, when he was in the desert and he had the burning bush experience. The third time, when he brought the tablets with the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai. Fourth, when he struck the rock twice instead of only once. And lastly, when he was on the border of the land of Canaan, the promised land. I believe all these situations and moments of time that happened have one common denominator that reveal and display a very real battle. And it was in the area of anger. That there was something that fueled that anger and underlying that anger, there was something much, much deeper. And I believe that it was a crisis of his true identity and who he believed he was and saw himself to be. This dictated how he responded in different situations and circumstances throughout his life, throughout his whole life. If we look at the beginning of Moses' life, he was found in a river after all the other Hebrew children had been murdered, found by the princess of the Pharaoh and raised as an Egyptian, raised to be Egyptian in dress, in speech, and in culture. And it would have been very clear to himself 
and very clear to others that he indeed was not an Egyptian, but actually a Hebrew, that he was not one of them, that just by looking at him, growing up and knowing that he really didn't belong and knowing that the king's family was not where he truly originated from, he would have known this. He would have had questions. And I believe that this is why he acted out of anger in killing the Egyptian soldier. It was not a righteous act. It was an act of self, his own anger, his own frustration, which stemmed from his lack of identity. We see that after running away into the desert, Moses married Zipporah. He was adopted into the Midianites, and he began a family and was a shepherd. And it's here that he first encounters his very first experience with the Lord in what we all know to be the burning bush experience. In where a bush was on fire, but not being consumed. And it's here that the Lord speaks and tells him to remove his sandals for where he stands is holy ground. The Lord then continues to reveal to Moses his true name, his might, his power, and what the Lord actually had called him to do. But again, we see by Moses' response that something's up. His response being, I can't, I am nothing, and I am no one. Moses struggled with a crisis of identity and value. Even after the Lord showing his great power and with the Lord's direction and with Aaron's help, we know that Moses yields and indeed goes to his people and those very people that were in slavery actually get set free and that they begin the promise, the journey to the promised land. When we see that after crossing the Red Sea, seeing the miraculous, they are now camped on the border of Canaan. And the 12 spies have been sent. 10 come back with negative reports and 2 return with good reports. But what happens? Once again, Moses in his crisis, instead of remembering what the Lord said, he listens to the people and chooses not to enter the land, listening to the people's fear and unbelief. And instead, for the next 40 years, they wander through the wilderness. We see that Moses' need to be accepted and valued is more. His desire to be accepted by the people is greater. And Moses, in that moment, becomes a people pleaser. We then see at Mount Sinai, when Moses goes up to the mountain and receives the tablets and the Ten Commandments written by the very hand of God, that even after experiencing and glimpsing the law like no other person ever had up until that time, we see that on his return trip back down the mountain where they camped, Moses sees what his brother and his fellow people have been up to while he's been away. He gets so angry that he smashes the tablet. Not because the Lord told him to, but out of his own anger, his own frustrations, and anger that has been at play in his life since a young man. And I believe that anger rose up once again because of a lack of understanding and not seeing his very own struggles, not truly understanding who he really was in God, that the underlying insecurity of identity, of not feeling listened to, of people opposing him brought this anger out. He acted out of self. We then see how the Lord looks after his rebellious people. The Lord provides food and manna and quail from heaven, shade in the day, a pillar of fire by night, and water. And it's here that the Lord instructs Moses to strike the rock once, but instead, once again, out of anger towards the people, Moses strikes the rock twice. His anger, his feelings, his conflict. I believe that unfortunately, Moses' crisis of his identity, his true value, and his call, he missed out. That at the end of his life, he did not enter into the promised land. That land promised all those years ago where they could have settled and lived so many years ago and the vision realized. But instead, for many, many years, struggled. There is no question that he was a man of God, that when he passed, he would be with the Lord. But how sad that he missed out in the blessing on the life 
that he had on earth. That true blessing, that true rest, that true fulfillment that he could have experienced in his actual lifetime. I believe that today there are many of us that also battle with the issue of identity and value. And that we too could be ripped off from the blessing and freedom and confidence that we can have in Christ. Reactions are a very human response to what's happening internally on the inside of us. That not knowing whom we truly are in Christ and not knowing how truly loved we are, not knowing how we are accepted because of what Jesus has done for us, I'm not talking about head knowledge, I'm talking about heart knowledge. There's a difference. That we struggle to live with confidence and in turn can be robbed of being all that God created us to be when he knitted us in our mother's womb. For some, it may be anger that rises up towards ourself. It can be anger that rises up towards other people. It can come out with false humility, with shame, with depression, with poor confidence, with a lack of control, comparing yourself to others, problems asking for what you need, worry and self-doubt, trouble accepting positive feedback, negative self-talk, talking badly about yourself, a fear of failure and a really poor outlook, a lack of boundaries and people-pleasing. I believe it is important that we be honest with ourselves, and in being honest with ourselves, we can be honest with God. It's so interesting <laughs> that even though the scripture clearly says that God sees all and knows all, we try to hide things from God. Yet he sees all and he knows all. We try to hide our issues from God. Please understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying to put a confidence in ourselves, but what I'm saying we need to put a confidence in the Lord, in his word and what he says we are and who we are. Not our family, not our past, not our experiences, our roles, our titles, our jobs or our finances. I believe that it's important to know who God says we are. And this is what the word says. This is what God says. God says you are chosen. Ephesians 1.4, he says, For he, had, he has chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. We, you, have been redeemed. Romans 3.24. For all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption of that came by Christ Jesus, that we are free. Romans 6, verse 6 to 7, for we know that our old self was crucified with him, so the body ruled by sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Amen? He says, you are beautiful, in Psalm 139, verse 14. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. You need to know that full well, people. He says that we are an heir. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 7, it says, So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. He says you are chosen. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. We are valuable people. In Job 33 verse 4, it says, the spirit of God has made me, the breath of the almighty gives me life. You know what? We have purpose. You have purpose. Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Do you believe that God has got a plan for you that is filled with hope and a future? You have been called. You are important. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, 
that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And God says, you are mine. Isaiah 43 verse 1. That now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. And lastly, he says that we are his child. In 1 John verses 3, verse 1, it says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us, it is that it did not know him. And I could actually keep going on for hours with what the word says about who we are and what the Bible clearly states who we are. I believe that today the Lord wants us to give our issues and our conflict and ask him to remove these things from our our life so that we can actually receive a deeper revelation of who we are. We have to yield those things, people. Because even though we know God sees all and he knows all, yet we try to hide things. But you know what? When we do that, actually what you do is put a wall up. Because you're not yielded in that moment. You're not humbling yourself in that moment. You're not giving that thing over to God. You're not asking God to help you in that. You're actually standing in your own strength but guess what you don't have strength because you're standing in your own self we need to yield those things over to God the scripture says in Proverbs 25 verse 4 remove the dross from the silver and a silversmith can produce a vessel The scripture says that we are Christ's workmanship, that in Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, and we should walk in them. You know, that dross are those things that come up to the surface. When there's issues, when there's pressure, when there's stress, what comes up to the surface? What comes up out of your mouth? What comes out of the attitude of your heart? That's the dross. And it's in those times that that dross rises and it's these things that the Lord actually wants to scoop out of our life so that we can be pure, so that we can be free, so that we can be whole, to be who God's called us to be. Because that dross is the impurity and God does want to remove it so that what remains is pure and in the hands of our Lord... We can be who God called us to be, living out destiny with freedom and with confidence. Um, I know that for me, I uh, went through a really traumatic time as a 20-year-old girl, and uh, it was something that really rocked me to my foundations, and it was all about my origin, where I came from. And it was really challenging and really hard, and it actually came about in not a very nice way, where it was revealed to me that um, my birth father was not the man who raised me. And it was a hidden thing. It was a thing that was, had been done in shame and had been hidden away. And so at 20 years old, pregnant with my second, I get a phone call late at night to talk about the fact that this really terrible thing that's been hidden away in the dark, in shame, uh, is revealed. And it wasn't done in a way to be helpful, it wasn't done in a way to bless me, but it was done in a way to actually destroy a family. And uh, at that time, I was the only Christian in my family. And uh, so I'm sure if you were in that situation, think about it, it's nine o'clock at night, you get a phone call, and it's your mum's really upset, she's actually beside herself, and then goes on to tell you this truth that you didn't know about yourself. And I remember just the struggle and in that moment just being so shocked. And in that moment, I remember saying, and all I could think about was, are you okay, mum? Are you okay, dad? Because the man that I had known as my father, and he is my father, um, 
I was as concerned about them. But then as time went on, because it wasn't just the fact that uh, he wasn't my dad, but actually then it came out, I don't, we actually don't know who your dad is. That's not a very nice feeling, I can tell you, <laughs> walking around going, actually, I've got no idea who my dad is. Biological father. And I remember being in quite a crisis of identity. And as a Christian, uh, it was a struggle. And I remember coming to a place where I actually went to the Lord because I needed him to give me peace. Because in the midst of all of this, I've got a mum and a dad who aren't Christian. I've got family who don't know the Lord that I've been reaching out to and witnessing to for years. And I need to know what to do. And I need to be able to have peace in my heart. And the Lord was so good. Because I remember when I came around the word and I came to, into his promises, I read the scripture. It was in that moment and it didn't take weeks and weeks, it was actually in a moment that the Lord sealed something in my heart, which was, it doesn't actually matter how it came about that you were brought into this life, but actually ultimately, our Heavenly Father, He is the one that knitted me in my mother's womb from the very beginning of time. And in that gave me great peace. And it was a revelation as far as it came to my identity. And so I know that there are different things that we all struggle with, but I wanna encourage us that as we've been hearing about the gifts that Pastor Brett's been teaching on, I believe it's important that we actually yield ourselves to God, everything. That we don't hide those secret things that actually we yield ourselves and we give those things over to God. Not in condemnation, but in the desire to be free, in the desire to be confident, in the desire to be all that God created you to be. To impact your family, to impact your community, and to see people saved. And the beautiful thing is, is at that time, I was the only Christian. But guess what? I'm not anymore. <laughs> God has done a good work in my family. And he used that situation. He used the way in which I acted out and I lived it out in being able to be a blessing and actually draw people to Jesus. And so I know that God can do this. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And I want them to sing that song again, Champion. So if they could make their way. And I actually want to open up the altar, and we've got a great prayer team, in that if the Lord has been speaking to you about maybe an area in your life, or there's some things that you need to yield over to God, that we can stand with you in prayer and in faith. Because it's Pastor Brett's desire and the leadership of this church's desire to see you be blessed to see you be whole, to see you be encouraged, to see you be empowered, to see you be sent out with the good news of Jesus Christ in seeing your loved ones, your family and your community come to Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done here, Lord, this morning in our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the washing of your word. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you have ministered to us. So Lord, as we go from this place, that we would indeed go with that revelation, that understanding, that confidence in knowing who we are. Lord, that we can touch our communities, that we can speak to our families with boldness, God, that we'd not hold back, but God, that we would go with you and that we would put our trust in you. So Lord, just thank you for what you've done and bless Lord each and every person that is here in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God's good, amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering. The Lord Jesus, amen. He is worthy.